Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson, Executive Director of CIO Programs here at IDG, and I'm very pleased today to be chatting with Sarah Nackvi, who is the Executive Vice President and CIO of HMS Host Incorporated. HMS Host is the leading contract food service operator in the travel market. They have restaurant operations in nearly 120 airports, including 20 of the busiest in North America, and also at 100 rest highway rest stops across North America, Europe, and parts of Asia Pacific. Worldwide, HMS Host is a $3.5 billion company that employs more than 30,000 associates. It has an IT staff of around 90 people who have to balance the technology demands of more than 300 brands that are being served in those airports and rest stops in an increasingly complex digital operation that integrates with airlines, airports, and other businesses serving the public. Sarah began her career at HMS Host as a programmer analyst in the year 2000. She progressed rapidly through IT leadership roles to VP of IT by 2004 and then CIO by 2013. Her focus during the last six years has particularly been on driving innovation through a sweeping digital business transformation that has been aimed at and improving the travel experience for us all. Last year, we were fortunate to have Sarah as one of our keynote speakers at our CIO Perspectives event in Reston, Virginia. And her talk then, as something we'll get into more today, was all about digitizing the customer journey. One of the many other things we'll talk about today is how her IT organization has been changing and adapting to this incredibly expanding and changing digital business ecosystem at HMS Host. Sarah, delightful to have you here today. Thanks for joining us. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you for having me. I remember when we talked earlier, one of the things that struck me when we were talking about the HMS host brand and how to talk about it, that it's almost a brand that hides in plain sight. Uh, you even call it that, a hidden brand. What do you mean by that? Well, we, we service uh, travelers behind our brands. Within our portfolio, we've got about approximately 300 brands. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, Chili's, uh, Burger King, Starbucks, mm -hmm. uh, to name a few. So most of the time when customers are dining with us, they feel that they are dining with Starbucks, not necessarily HMS Toast. Yes. You multiply that with 300 such brands, then certainly we are very much hidden within the brands. Yes. Well, and I remember, too, that I expected that a lot of your customers would be business travelers. But from what you were telling me, the two types of travelers out there, leisure travelers, actually make up the bigger segment. Yes, of course. Well, you know, from a, from a business standpoint, we are targeting three different sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, one being definitely the business travelers, the other being the leisure travelers, and then the third component of our business are those uh, employees that are that are working within the airports, mm -hmm. so airline employees, airport employees. So those are definitely captured audience uh, that we seek to leverage. But from a business traveler standpoint, there's some very startling differences as far as behavior is concerned, um, as as well as the digital adoption. Mm -hmm. Business travelers certainly seem to be more acclimated with technology and they seem to be more uh, pressed on time somehow. Leisure travelers from a psychological standpoint seem to be a little bit more relaxed than our business travelers. Yes. So when we seek uh, technology solutions, our target is definitely business travelers, uh, less leisure travelers compared to that. Okay, can you give me an example of something that you have rolled out in, in the recent year or two that business travelers would recognize? Yes, so um, a number of kiosks are now within a part of our portfolio, so that's definitely moving very aggressively uh, with an idea that speed of service to any traveler is important within uh, within an airport environment. Uh, we now have uh, tabletop devices available through which uh, customers are able to place orders and make payments as well. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, um, more recently we deployed QR codes which are just designed for payment. Mm -hmm. When we studied a customer's journey, we find them to be most anxious uh, when they're done with their dining and are ready to make a payment. Um, so how do we really fast track that? How do we make that easier for a customer when they're done to not have to wait for a server and execute on the payment and, and leave the facilities? Table turn um, is also an important part for us. The, mm -hmm. few, the more the tables, uh, the faster that we are able to turn the tables 
obviously it leads to more revenue. All of those factors influence you know, some of our decisions as far as enabling speed of service. In addition to that, we are now um, exploring robotics. You know, Pepper, the robot is very much a, a product within a footprint. If not anything, it's definitely attracting customers to our facilities. Mm -hmm. um, through those um, robotic solutions, uh, customers are able to engage with the menus um, and find uh, the restaurants to be a little bit more exciting. So those are examples of few of the technologies that we've implemented. Well, I, I can really sympathize with that traveler anxiety about wanting to get your bill paid and and to your gate because you find yourself relaxing during your meal and then all of a sudden you're like oh well they're going to board in 20 minutes and I had a, a recent experience in the Jacksonville airport where I'd gotten my card out to use it in the tabletop device and it was ready already giving me the receipt and I you know and I looked at that and I thought that must be some sort of near field communication because I had literally not swiped it but it knew exactly who I was. So, yes, yes. So and, I, you th know, it's, I thought of you and your folks, and I thought I have Sarah <laughs> to thank for this. The, the one thing that um, I do have to say that HMS Host, we are definitely looking at technology, but at the same time, we know that there are uh, different customers with different preferences. So the, the striking the balance between giving that in-person experience versus that experience where mm -hmm. people feel more comfortable engaging with technology. Yep. It's a balance that we are trying to strike. We want to bring in technology um, as, as a part of the journey, but not be the, the journey. So, right. you know, focusing on that and creating that balance is an important part of our business. Yes. Let's talk a little bit before we move on and talk more about digital transformation. I talk a little bit about some of the limitations and difficulties of having to operate in the airport environment. Yeah, quite a few, actually. I mean, you can imagine <laughs> I can that. I imagine, yes. <laughs> yeah, as, as you are traveling, every airport seems to have different procedures. I mean, some of them are standard for sure, but the experience that you may have uh, going through an airport, it differs from airport to airport. And that's um, indicative of, you know, what are some of the TSA staffing, uh, how deep are the lines, how many gates are available. So some of those limitations, especially if you're going to be looking at pre-ordering of food, how do we really account for when that food is going to be just ready for pickup, how long it's going to take for, you know, customers to go through, you know, different parts of an airport to get to a restaurant where the food could be ready. So uh, those are obviously very uh, difficult decisions for us to make. Airport to airport, uh, some airports allow us to implement our own uh, Wi-Fi, while other airports force us to use their Wi-Fi, for instance. Uh, we are very much constrained as far as some of the new technologies where they can be physically implemented. They have mm -hmm. to be within the bounds of a lease line, uh, which means that some t uh, at, you know, too often we are implementing technologies that are not clearly visible to our customers. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure, we ride off of airport infrastructure. So security protocols make it very difficult um, and should be taken into account where you can drill. I mean, kiosks are rapidly being deployed because they do help us with speed of service. Mm -hmm. But where can we can we physically install as far as drill a kiosk to the ground for stability? It's a constraint that in some airports we are able to do and others we're not. So um, certainly makes my life very interesting. And uh, <laughs> challenging least to say when we, when we think about these solutions. Uh, eventually we are feeling that it's uh, going to be a transition where customers are going to use their own devices to engage with us. Mm -hmm. And if that is the direction that we hope that the business and the industry would move towards, it'll make our life so much easier. Yes. Okay. Well, good. We'll put that on our list. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when we think about digital transformation, and you and I uh, talked about this, it's such a, it's a big fat buzzword in the industry right now. And what I found is that every industry thinks about it and views it differently. If you talk to someone in the oil and gas industry and you say digital transformation, they think you're, you know, they're talking then about the digital oil field and about the things that people can do with uh, iPads when they're there. Uh, tell me what digital transformation, what does it actually mean to HMS host? Yeah, you know, we went through the exact same struggle that you're referring to mm -hmm. within our organization itself. Every single department had a different definition of digital. So before we could actually define that common phrase that meant to us, we had to do not only just a study of our customers, um, engage our different business leaders, uh, come to the table together uh, to get to the common understanding of what, what digital means to HMS hosts. 
we are in the travel industry. Uh, speed of service is absolutely important to our travelers. We have category of travelers um, that are classified as gate huggers. And I think we all <laughs> follow that category all the time. Right? Yeah. Once you get to the airport, the all you're thinking about is I want to get to the gate and I want to be stationed there. What does that mean? So we took all of these factors into consideration mm -hmm. and concluded that a digital to us means shaving seconds off of uh, Olympic time. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, it's speed of service. Digital also means an outside transformation and an internal transformation, which means um, that we do need to create those efficiencies for our travelers. At the same time, we want to make um, implement efficiencies for our employees, happy employee service, happy customers. Therefore, we want to make sure that uh, through digital transformation, we are able to uh, give our uh, employees those tools that make their lives efficient. Yes. Well, and um, when you and I spoke, I, you mentioned that some of the employee changes were things like labor management software you'd been able to put in, uh, things that, uh, for instance, part-time employment used to not be an option. And now because of the software you're able to use, it is. What are some of the other benefits that employees are seeing internal to the airports and to your company, and how has that affected retention rates? Sure, of course. So uh, employee engagement is a huge focus of HMS Host, really, how we feel, you know, if you look at uh, Gallup um, polls and Gallup studies, which, you know, for those that are not familiar with, uh, Gallup does a study of um, employees and their behaviors across the industry and across different sectors. Uh, thousands of companies, you know, uh, both uh, United States and certain focus studies are across the globe. And uh, they speak very highly about how engaged employees are uh, defined as, you know, 70, 80 percent uh, productive mm -hmm. compared to those that are disengaged employees, which is, you know, 25 percent or less, and actually they're sinking the boat. So employee engagement is a huge focus of ours. And as we surveyed our employees to really understand what drives the engagement, uh, then it is collaboration, collaboration with the managers, collaboration with the peers, and collaboration with uh, the company's vision and mission. So we've implemented and instituted um, tools that uh, drive collaboration. Um, a perfect example of that is something called the pre-shift meeting. So a pre-shift meeting is where our field employees are able to get together with their managers first thing in the morning and understand what the focus of that day is supposed to be. In that way, everybody is in sync, mm -hmm. um, trying to drive those targets uh, and not be disengaged with the, with the overall goals of the company are, or the goals of that airport might be. Um, so engaged employees, I mean, we, we also do recognition of these employees because there are some incredible stories uh, mm -hmm. of how our employees have helped their customers because of how engaged they were. I mean, from saving lives um, to really going above and beyond when uh, dealt with very dying conditions. So hmm. we're very pleased with that, and we definitely feel that digital transformation and technology is enabling and driving that engagement of our employees. That's great. The, um, the business transition that, that has gone on here for HMS Host is, has been, I'm sure, really interesting to watch internally because you've been with the company almost 20 years or a little over 20 years. Now, it started out, it was more of a service-based model when you think about IT, but today it is very much uh, the voice of strategy moving forward. Talk about that transition, how that changed your role as the CIO. Certainly. Uh, when I first became a CIO, uh, the focus was just, you know, filling in the gaps, really addressing mm -hmm. um, those issues that were stopping IT from delivering the support requirements of the business. So we yeah. continued to, for the first couple of years, just focus on removing, for instance, eliminating all single point of failures from our infrastructure, right. in bringing back stability and uh, developing SLAs that we could really live up to. As the environment became more and more stable, the company's expectations of what IT could and how IT could contribute towards business transformation uh, became an important part of it. So. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, the role of IT has changed very rapidly. Running of the business should be a given, uh, but CIOs, I strongly believe, if their focus is just running of the business, then they're going to become irrelevant very quickly. Because in this day and age, uh, studies through Gardner and some other organizations have proven that uh, some of the CIOs are now moving from the business side of the house and taking over IT shops. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us? It tells us that CIOs should absolutely be very much connected with the business. 
yes. understanding of the business. Um, and that's exactly what we've seen here. Running of the business is definitely a requirement and, and a given mm -hmm. for CIOs, but their, their success depends on their ability um, to really be seen as a business partner. I don't know if you can see behind my, uh, behind me, you'll see our vision statement. You know, we are, we see ourselves as the business transformers. We want yes. um, to use technology to drive business transformation. And not only did the organization was very receptive to that new role of IT, uh, but since then my role from being a CIO reporting into the CFO changed um, to that being reporting into the CEO because the expectation now was that IT would be a voice in developing uh, the strategy for the business rather than just being an executor of one. Yes. Um, so you're going to see that that is the role that successful CIOs um, are going to have to play in order to remain relevant. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, totally agree. Um, the, um, the next area of questioning I wanted to get into really takes us into the industry disruption that you're dealing with. And we've mentioned a few of those changing customer expectations, but they're very much mapping to what you're doing. Uh, for instance, social media impact has had a very big role in all of this. Talk a little bit about that, how you approach it, what sort of investments you've made to make sure, because I know that you have to have the great foundation in place, but then there's everything that has to be built on top of that. Of course. So social, I mean, you're absolutely right. Social media has been the biggest disruptor for uh, a business and has created an urgent need for us to really build procedures and processes around it such that we can really respond to it. Examples of, uh, you know, some of how social media is really impacting our lives um, is a customer dines at one of our restaurants. They have, a, whether they have a good experience or bad, instantaneously, um, they are really going on to the social channels and really um, starting a conversation through that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going, if companies are not going to have uh, procedures and processes and, um, and an environment to respond to those social channels very quickly, they're going to take a life that is going to be very difficult for marketing to handle and respond to. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've done is that we are definitely looking um, to leverage social channels through two different facets. One um, is really studying the conversations proactively, um, leveraging the good and really republishing the good comments that we are getting mm -hmm. and um, studying the bad um, or, or really critiques that we are receiving. Mm -hmm. um, and honing into are there trends there? You know, are they mm -hmm. stemming from a location, uh, stemming from a store, stemming from a certain brand, the type of experience, the type of dining experience? How does it translate into the type of management that we have? You know, mm -hmm. again, going back to engagement, do we have engaged employees or do we have disengaged employees that's re resulting in um, these conversations that are negative in nature? So we, we are definitely looking at uh, BI, business intelligence, really mm -hmm. studying some of the reports um, and trying to respond. Although I have to say that there is a long way to go before we are absolutely ready because the convers conversations are instantaneous yes. and sometimes our ability to respond to those conversations instantaneous, uh, in instantaneously is not practical and not realistic for companies as I So mm -hmm. it's a challenge. It's going to be something that we're going to have to respond to. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's so it's so interesting to talk about it and hear about it because five years ago it wouldn't have been something IT had to concern itself with. The social conversation was really something that marketing dealt with. Uh, tell me how you work with, what is your collaborative relationship like with the marketing side, not just of HMS Host, but with how you deal with the marketing folks and the other people out at those 300 plus brands who all have, they consider you a partner and a provider in a lot of ways. Yeah. So as far as brands are concerned, we are very constrained uh, from a brand agreements about what we can and cannot do. Oh, okay. um, so certainly from a digital transformation standpoint, um, it, it requires a tremendous amount of collaboration uh, when we uh, go through the ideation phase. Like for instance, uh, we are working uh, with one of the brands where we want to deploy kiosks. 
-hmm. and on the street side, they don't have kiosks, but we do feel that that's necessary within the environment. So we have to go through a lot of steps as, as far as brand approvals are concerned before we can bring any new technology. So it requires collaboration, not only with, um, you know, our contracts, studying the contracts, understanding our limitations and the do's and the don'ts, collaborate with marketing uh, within those brands um, and really get the required approvals. As far as our internal marketing is concerned, uh, we are very quick, um, quickly realizing um, that digital marketing is a different type of talent. Mm -hmm. Organizations may or may not have that type of talent internally. Yeah. Uh, for instance, you know, signage, digital signage. Um, if we have kiosks, uh, how should we market those most profitable products? Uh, what mm -hmm. should the flow be when customers are engaging with digital? How many clicks does it take before customers disengage with a certain workflow? Yeah. All of yeah. those things, we are finding that uh, we have low attrition, which is a good thing. Our mm -hmm. business is complex. We need the attrition to be very low. Um, but how do we really bring in that new talent and create that balance so that we are continuing to grow and respond to that? So we collaborate very heavily with uh, marketing, and we find that marketing has uh, some very good uh, third-party vendors mm -hmm. uh, that brings that knowledge base in that allows us to sharp up our digital marketing campaigns, uh, which are quite different mm -hmm. uh, than our uh, historical, you know, printing of menus and so forth. Right. So an interesting transformation leads to say that um, is definitely going on in marketing and shaping our communication with them. Yes. Well, and I and this reminds me too of the of your innovation center because that's in terms of partnering with outside vendors and probably with some of your brands. Uh, tell me about the innovation center, um, how you staff it, how it gets used. Uh, just sort of a little bit of a deep dive into that piece of it. Sure. So it's it has been an interesting transformation, at least to say, because what was happening uh, when IT was very busy, you know, plugging the holes and, and really um, improving our support model, the need from the business was that they really wanted to move very aggressively into the digital space. So what they were doing uh, was that they were engaging outside of IT with third party vendors and really trying to bring in these new technologies within our space. And of course, I'm sure that many CIOs can relate to this, mm -hmm. um, that the vendors come in and say this, you, you do not need any help from IT. We can quickly get this done for you and you should be up and about in no we just time. We need your credit card and, number. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Of course. So um, it's done and it's implemented and it's implemented incorrectly or doesn't work as designed. And then we had business, you know, knocking at our door to build in all of those sophistications that should have been taken into consideration to, uh, at the incept of the uh, project. But it didn't. So mm -hmm. in order to address all of those challenges, uh, we created a lab. We we think we've been very creative with it. We call mm -hmm. it Imagine IT, or you can mm -hmm. say Imagine, Imagine it. it. Yeah. And um, it, it's, uh, although no help from marketing, I have to give credit to my talented IT people for coming really? up with that name. That is great, uh, because oftentimes when IT people come up with a name, the first thing you want to do is change it. <laughs> Exactly. Yes. So I'm really pleased with that. I think they were quite creative. Yeah, um, so great. we've created that lab and it's done a couple things. It has benefited the vendors um, as well as benefited IT and then improved our collaboration with the business. So now in today's environment, if a vendor approaches any of our business partners with a new technology that they want our businesses to look at, they very quickly directed uh, that uh, vendor to us, to mm -hmm. IT. The innovation lab is designed in such a way it's completely isolated from our rest of our network. Mm -hmm. It's fully equipped with Wi-Fi. It is a plug and play environment for the lack of better words. Um, so if the vendor um, is interested, uh, we reach out to the vendor and, and ask them and invite them to get their technology set up within our lab. Mm -hmm. And in return, we uh, do offer them uh, full visibility to uh, engage with our executives. So we do have a day when um, you know executives are invited down to the innovation lab uh, and the vendors are definitely allowed to showcase. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, we have technologies in there where the business has looked at it and said, we don't have an application mm -hmm. uh, for this within our facilities, for instance. So that's the risk vendors are ready to take. Uh, it has centralized um, 
the decision making from outside of IT into IT where it belongs. Mm -hmm. uh, we do get a chance to do a cursory review of any new technologies and the vendors are pretty pleased because uh, they get access to the critical decision makers uh, when they work with us and collaborate with us. So mm -hmm. that process has been working really well, um, I would have to say, and, and certainly uh, engage IT better with the business. Yes. Uh, and really shadow ITs have, as a result, disappeared. Well, and it, it helps, too, to show the uh, folks on your business side that IT understands the issues that they are trying to solve. Right, um, of That uh, remote payment ability that you mentioned earlier, that was one of the ideas that was developed and came out of the lab. Yes, yes. And, and so uh, we were sitting, actually, through a, a business briefing uh, where uh, it wasn't even focused on what's happening with the employees. It was more studying the abandonment rate and survey results and comparing it to engaged employees, to engaged employees service customers better. It was that kind of a study. And um, comments were constantly being made that customers seem to be more frustrated when they are waiting for the servers, mm -hmm. when servers are quite busy serving those that want to be fed, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, so at that time, we just came back and uh, dropped a couple things within our innovation lab. And I have to say, the next thing is history. I mean, customers, our business came back and was just very excited that we were really tackling a critical business problem, not only just a business problem, but it was going to really allow us to table turn, uh, mm -hmm. improve our table turn, and give good customer service to our customers. Interesting. Well, I remember talking a couple of years ago with a CIO in the restaurant business, um, more of a, you know, an elegant dining type restaurant chain. And he had mentioned the first time he saw tabletop kiosks was at in an airport. And it was one of the brands in the airport. And they did a pilot project with their particular restaurants and discovered that people didn't want that kind of experience when they were going somewhere to sit down and have, you know, a casual, nice, longer meal. So a lot of times the customers will pretty quickly tell you what they like and don't like. Yes. And, and that's what, uh, you know, to my earlier comment for us, mm -hmm. Uh, we want technology to be a subtle introduction as a within the journey, not be the experience. Right, right. Uh, the experience has to be good food. The experience has to be good experience and the good uh, engagement mm -hmm. um, and actually giving customers the choices that they want. There's some like me when I get to the airport, I want my space. I, I don't want to, you know, engage. I just want to focus on, you know, what's ahead of me. Yes. Uh, if that's what I desire, then I should have options um, that conforms to my needs. While mm -hmm. others, they're more social, more relaxed, uh, more uh, chatty with our servers. So that's fine as well. <laughs> Or there are people like me who get to the airport way too early and like to well, get we there. we like and, people like you. Yes, we well, like I shop like while I'm there and, and all that go. sort of thing. It's always been a family rule that my husband imposed years ago. We leave yeah. for the airport at least two hours earlier than we really need to. Um, and those are the best kinds for us. They really, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Especially when there's little jewelry stores and places you can buy cosmetics and things like that. Um, let's talk a little bit about disruption because that is always a, a interesting topic I find to CIOs, especially those who are so tuned into the business now. Uh, you mentioned that you've got the Amazons of the world, that in terms of disrupting your business, what might get in there and cause you to do something quicker or have to respond. Um, it, uh, flesh that out a little bit for me. I mean, it seems like you would be so well embedded in an airport business that you wouldn't have to worry about losing them as clients. So who are your who are your disruptors or your competitive threats? I, I wouldn't say that, you know, uh, necessarily we are worried about it. We feel that we have a pretty uh, good model that works. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we won't be as successful as we are. Uh, uh, and we are pretty good at really looking at uh, what are the disruptors and really preparing ourselves to respond to that. Um, I do think that uh, what we have to pr be prepared and plan for um, is, you know, how are our airports evolving yes. and what are some of their aspirational goals mm -hmm. uh, that would, in essence, create disruption for us? Okay. Uh, you know, there, when the apps first came about, for instance, uh, there was definitely every airport, every airline mm -hmm. wanted to have their own app, their unique app through which they wanted to engage with yep. the uh, with their customers. Then 
we ended up, we went through that hype cycle and mm-hmm. we came out at the other end saying that there is an app fatigue out there. You know, I have so many apps. <laughs> yeah. How many of the apps do people really use? Mm-hmm. Um, with us being a hidden brand and the the only company that can scale from one airport to another, mm-hmm. our focus, we start out by looking at the customer. What ultimately should we be giving an experience to the customer, mm-hmm. whether they use an American Airlines app or a United app or an airport app, how should our technologies conform mm-hmm. to give the airports that single experience so we are not a disruptor to their journey? Mm-hmm. So stuff like that, we are constantly. So you'll, you'll see that we've invested uh, very heavily in, um, in solutions that allow us to really be plug and play. Whoever wants to engage with us, we are okay. ready to really respond to that challenge. Um, so that's how we are looking at it. If you look at what um, you know, what we are planning for, airports want diversity of brands. Some airports mm-hmm. require local brands. Local brands, uh, these are small mom and pop shops that have gained you know traction within that community. Yes. Well, how do we really force them to conform, or should we be even forcing them to conform to what our digital aspirations may be? Mm-hmm. And how do we really create? Because every brand wants to maintain their own experience. Well, and the smaller the brand, the less likely they're going to have a very sophisticated approach to technology. Right. So, yeah. so often, I mean, uh, 99.99% of the time, uh, we do have all of the brands that operate on our systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, it's good when even if they are smaller brands, we can certainly bring them on. What we cannot uh, force them to um, is that experience. If they don't like digital within their space because that's the experience right. that they're proud of, then digital has to stay out of that experience. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. So it's constantly striking a balance between what the airport wants, what the customers want, what the brand requirements are, and then putting on top of it what our own own aspirational goals are in order to maintain market leadership. Yes. Well, and we mentioned we were talking about mobile apps a moment ago. Is that what your host-to-coast system is? Is that a mobile app? It sounds like I should have a mobile app for HMS host, and I don't. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, honestly, it doesn't doesn't matter. We do uh, realize that People half the time don't even know they're dining with us. So why would they go and download Coast to Coast, correct? Right. Um, so we did do, it was, we did enter into that market to test the waters to really with the focus of trying to figure out uh, what a mobile award, a loyalty platform may look like. Mm-hmm. You know, are customers loyal to a brand or are they loyal to each of host, for instance? Um, right. So Host to Coast was designed um, to really test the market uh, as far as loyalty was concerned mm-hmm. um, and also for pre-order of the meals. Uh, and wow. um, yes. because of speed of service, customers, if you're standing in a TSA line, you're able to pre-order your meal, and when you get to that concept um, or, or to that store, to that restaurant, it's ready for you. So speed of service again before you get to your gate, the food is ready. Yes. However, uh, what we are finding is that that app is predominantly being used less for pre-order, mm-hmm. more for really browsing to see what our dining options are available within the airport, which yep. works as well, because I, I, I'm sure that you can relate to is how many times do we walk an entire terminal mm-hmm. before deciding, okay, what's out here and what is it that exactly I want to have? Yes. So those decisions are not being made till you've passed every con- every store, mm-hmm. uh, every restaurant until, uh, and then you're reverting back. So most of our usage on host to coast mm-hmm. is coming from browsing to see what dining options, which works fine. Yes. If they're browsing, they're most likely stopping by it's mm-hmm. not a pre-order, but it's still a capture for us. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking about the reasons why I download individual airport apps is to find the map. So I can see what terminal I'm in and not only see restaurant options, but what sort of other shopping there might be since I'm there with right. so much time on my hands. Um, let, me, uh, let me ask you next. This has been... Um, uh, one of the things you touched on a couple of times, the, the word uh, speed, the speed of service to customers, and but the speed of transformation that's going on in the industry. That when we were talking about the things disrupting the travel and the food services industry, that was one of the first things you mentioned, that as an industry, you don't feel like your industry is all that well prepared for the speed of transformation. So as the CIO at HMS Host, how do you... How do you get your business executives prepared for that? Yeah, speed, you know, what's happening is that we've got at a corporate office about 500 people. Mm -hmm. I 
expect all 500 to be somewhat technology experts because of how rapidly um, technology is evolving. Mm -hmm. um, so playing catch up is, or, or being ahead of it at times is quite difficult uh, mm -hmm. because of the rapid pace at which it's changing. Mm -hmm. As far as um, driving speed to market, I mean, we've made some very critical decisions as I alluded to earlier. Um, is that when new technologies come about, what is imperative for IT to be successful is have the ability to really connect and try those new technologies out to see what uh, the results are or pilot or proof of concept quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, if, we, if I look at my landscape, the biggest limitation that I found that was inhibiting my ability to really uh, test out new technologies quickly mm -hmm. was our dependence on third parties. For instance, a point of sale um, is a third party provider. If I'm going to connect anything to my point of sale, then I am absolutely dependent on uh, the vendor reacting to my priorities at the speed at, at which I mm -hmm. want them to react. And nine out of 10 times, the vendors were not reacting, whether it's point of sale or um, if it is some other technology that I like to try out. So in order to really uh, remove that dependency, we invested um, close to $3 million, uh, a little uh, over that, uh, to build this middleware platform, uh, mm -hmm. which was uh, designed to really connect anything to our POS. It was like 90% developed with a 10% modification to it based on which endpoint was going to connect mm -hmm. to our downstream point of sale systems. What that has allowed us to do um, is really keep the downstream systems, including POS and the local field procedures and processes intact, yet open the floodgates to connect many endpoints. Mm -hmm. As far as transformation and speed to market um, and speed of service, call it whatever, what, what that's done for us is that we've now eliminated our dependency on the vendor. Mm -hmm. This investment is paying off where new technologies could go to production or to proof of concept. Uh, previously, it would take six, uh, six to eight months, sometimes over a year. Mm -hmm. Now we are able to do it in weeks. Uh, in addition to that, with a structured, you know, Systems, open APIs, we are able to very quickly make that available to our vendors. So vendors are excited mm -hmm. uh, to connect with us, knowing that you know testing a concept uh, within weeks is certainly a desirable outcome. And we are getting better deals from financial deals, um, better ability to project applications, test out returns, and gather empirical data that's relevant to making these decisions. So it's absolutely transforming our business now mm -hmm. with that same concept in mind uh, we are trying to build uh, and make similar investment on our mobile platform um, so that we can connect to any mobile endpoints uh, you know we have uh, many airlines and airports engaging with us often that says how can you make your dining options available uh, through our uh, solutions that our customers we already have a following i mean you know yeah. how can we now make the, those customers more excited that was the first step now we have airlines coming in and saying okay well let's improve on those partnerships can we exchange mm -hmm. Um, you know, cash and miles for food purchases, or when they buy food mm -hmm. from you, can we transform that into miles? Mm -hmm. So as you can see, like a, a very small step is now ideation has led to yes. quite a few advancements that hopefully we can bring to fruition mm -hmm. this year. Well, that's always kind of the, <clears throat> that's always sort of the beautiful thing with technology innovations of any kind <clears throat> going into it. People don't realize uh, that they're getting something they never knew they always wanted, and then it leads to other ideas. Right. So the um, I wanted to ask you uh, to get into a bit more detail about uh, you do an awful lot with a staff of 89, 90 IT people across the world here. Tell me about how you have IT organized and and how you have the how you have things structured so that you can do so much on the digital leading edge, but then still also keep all of that incredible foundation running across what did we say over 200 airports around the world so how do you how do you organize and structure this sure <clears throat> just point of clarification the 200 um, airports that we have um, it is in north america so we do have a separate it that does the global uh, okay. for the asia and the europe side of the house mm -hmm. uh, 
I have to say that there's never a dull moment in my <laughs> life, which keeps the job very exciting yes. and hence the 20 years of service here. Yes. Uh, but as far as IT is structured, you know, previously we were as any IT shop, very focused on support. Um, we had teams that were completely uh, mixed up, uh, you know, those that were doing um, R&D work as well as support. And we found that to be very challenging. Governance mm -hmm. became an issue, um, really projecting out the impact of a business request when it comes to, you know, products that they wanted to implement. Um, that became a huge challenge. Uh, and we felt that as an organization, I didn't comfortably could go to the business and say X percentage of IT is going towards business transformation. I just couldn't do that because of how we were structured. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a combination of the same individuals that were doing support as well as R&D work. Yeah. Um, so since then, we have um, gone through a, a a level of evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now embarking on a journey where we are separating out IT into two distinct um, towers. Mm -hmm. Actually, I would say three. Uh, one being more focused on uh, really being business enablement. So we have a, um, a structure in mind where one part of um, our tower, uh, a VP level individual that would be uh, engaged with the business mm -hmm. on really bringing in the flow of uh, new request. All R&D work uh, that uh, the business demands and we would have a set of uh, individuals, very business facing and uh, these are, uh, the technical job is but 20%, 80% of that is business. Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So they are product managers, for instance. I mean, to give you an example, we deployed uh, kiosks. So we would have product, product managers of kiosks under this business enablement function. Mm -hmm. uh, product managers would be studying how a kiosk is performing. Why is it performing better in one location and not so great in another? Yeah. What's wrong uh, with, if there are any issues with where it is positioned, where within the employee experience are they physically placed, for instance. And likewise, we would have product managers for tabletops and payment solutions. And so they are a, a set of product managers that are within this function. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, uh, this function also has a digital engagement manager. So they are the ones that are really taking in the input from the business and prioritizing, figuring out what the business priorities are, yeah. doing high level cursory business cases um, and uh, presenting them or uh, presenting them to the technical IT. Uh, for uh, development or consideration as far as capacity versus demand. In addition to that, within the same business uh, engagement, we have the PMO, the project management office. Um, so they are uh, really the experts in uh, developing um, you know, and managing projects, mitigating risks. They live and breathe projects mm -hmm. um, and they keep the technical team in line because we all know technical teams do not want to document. They don't want to, they just want to be heads down coders. So mm -hmm. uh, we've taken away that function, the PMO and created the PMO under the business enablement function. Yes. In addition to that, the fourth piece that we have within this tier um, is IT governance. You know, how do we keep the budget? How do we mm -hmm. uh, meet the expectations of business cases? How do we really do a post audit of business cases yeah. and make sure that whatever we committed to from a value proposition, how do we go back and um, validate those? Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that's the function within the business side of IT. Okay. We also consider the same function, the, the same group to be the one that is our R&D. So if today the CEO were to ask me how much are we investing, mm -hmm in uh, R&D, it is the entire cost of that function uh, that would really tell me that that's where IT is contributing towards business transformation and growth. Interesting. Well, I know a lot right of... Side. Yeah. Sorry, just finishing my train of thought on the right side of the business. The second tier that I have is all engineering. Um, and it's it's doing, uh, you know, the enterprise architects and the engineers. Mm -hmm. So that's that one tier uh, that's doing all of the R&D work for our um, business enablement function. So they are the source, they are the developers for that function. The third mm -hmm. tier that I have is IT servicing, and that is all 
managing vendors, managing our products, that is the support function. So mm -hmm. you can see that the development and support is distributed into two different areas. Um, so support is all under this tier. The help desk, the ERP solutions, everything to run the business is under this tier. Great. Security is there. It's, it's uh, yeah. I guess you could consider that the fourth function within my organization, yeah. and that is all security and mitigating risk. Well, do you find, especially in the digital product area, do the lines between IT and business essentially start getting kind of fuzzy? I mean, does it they gray? <clears throat> they are. And and to my earlier point where I said that digital, the CIOs in tomorrow's environment, there is a likelihood of them coming from the business side of the house. Look at, you know, if I look at my IT, it's half business, half technical yes good and and that's the fabric of it which is very different than what it used to be uh, you know five years ago where it was all technical resources mm -hmm. it's definitely created a different environment for it mm -hmm. and it's it's created um enabled a lot more understanding of the business side um of the house by technical people the mm -hmm. mere fact that the cio now has both of those functions under them um, yes. or under me i guess uh, mm -hmm. which is helping the technical team understand the business better yeah well it i mean it certainly is a it feels like the digital workplace of the future the way yes. it organizations it seems like a very a very sensible way to structure I mean, when I hear you describe it, I can imagine how you can take care of all of those different brands and airports, you know, throughout North America and around the world. Last question I want to ask you has to do with uh, talent acquisition and retention. Um, you had mentioned that you've relaunched some intern programs lately, and you're uh, diving into relationships with high school students. I just we'll we'll finish up talking about that about how you keep you've got an amazing IT organization how do you keep it how do you retain them how do you find new people uh, how do you continue to challenge them so um, from the high schooler standpoint uh, the idea there is not necessarily to attract them to IT mm -hmm. but the idea there is uh, you know, too often high school students may not even know what opportunities exist within the food and beverage industry. Mm -hmm. um, so the way the program works is that we do reach out to local high schools and ask them to uh, suggest or recommend their bright students that are undecided as far as the career lines are concerned, okay. but yet have a huge potential. Uh, they are brought in for an eight week study uh, within our groups, uh, within our corporate office, and uh, they uh, get to spend two weeks in each of a critical department. Mm -hmm. So I might have a high schooler with an IT for two weeks, and I would expose them to different functions within IT. I would educate them about what it takes uh, to be successful, what are some of the skills, mm -hmm. and what are some exciting opportunities and options that they could potentially consider as, as they look at a college career um, to start with. Uh, likewise, those individuals could be spending two weeks in legal, others could be in culinary. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of rotate them into uh, different departments every year so that they are exposed to what are the opportunities within the food and beverage. Um, that's so that's uh, definitely you see a lot of excitement and you see clarity in these students, which is quite rewarding mm -hmm. uh, when they walk away at the end of eight weeks with lots of options to consider, which otherwise they wouldn't have been exposed to. Yes. Um, so that's definitely an option. As far as um, internship is concerned, uh, we do um, have programs with University of Maryland and some of the local universities uh, where we are trying to uh, reach out and uh, create programs for them. Um, and when these interns come in, we are treating them not as project work, but giving them on a specific project that we might just need staff augmentation, but, but instead we are giving them a business challenge that can be solved through digital. Interesting. So for instance, uh, queue lines, you know, the queue, mm -hmm. uh, the, we let them visit an airport, watch a concept and come back and really uh, give us some really innovative uh, ideas about how we can perhaps address mm -hmm. an employee challenge or address a business challenge um, and let them present at the end of their uh, tenure here at host to the executive team with their ideas mm -hmm. uh, that polishes them from the you know presentation skills and uh, certainly helps them develop and we get a lot of benefit when they come up with their ideas as to how because in fact 
you know, those that is the generation that we should be targeting. I mean, that yes. they are going to generate ideas that uh, would serve as their needs of the future. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's an interesting program. So we do that through the internship. Um, in addition to that, uh, we very recently and unfortunately have not been able to make the the level of progress that I had hoped for. Uh, we are trying to. Uh, connect uh, with uh, institutes like the um, MITs of the world and, and mm-hmm. really figure out um, how can we uh, create a more uh, regular rotation throughout the year mm-hmm. uh, with their, um, you know, their MBA students or the master's program and create a project uh, mm-hmm. that we probably and um, in return we could do, you know, scholarships. And again, these are some ideas that we have on the table that in return we could contribute uh, for uh, towards their education for a successful business outcome that could be implemented. Great. Uh, so Great. it's uh, those are the three channels. Now, the fourth channel, which is just as important initially when I took on innovation, um, you know, the idea was to really create an innovation team. I don't think that's realistic. I mean, after being in that, mm. um, you know, trying to achieve that for the last three years, I've concluded that no company... Uh, uh, should really think that just because they have an innovation team or they decide that they want to have an innovation team that all yeah. the innovation ideas are going to be you know all um, taken care of instead right. uh, what we have done is that we've picked a few strategic partners mm-hmm. um, and that we are in our final stages of uh, finalizing the agreement and uh, that have very diverse um, presence across the globe Great. and have a diverse skill set that, that that they themselves have um, internship and student programs mm-hmm. through which they're bringing in new talent. Uh, and we've committed innovation dollars through them yes. uh, on a yearly basis so that to give them an incentive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in return, what they are supposed to be doing for us is once a quarter, uh, they should be... Uh, and. Uh, you know, absolutely, we are picking up these vendors that have experience within our space, mm-hmm. uh, the airports of food and beverage, and every quarter they are to come up with a idea, substantial enough idea, that we could agree to take to proof of concept. Interesting. Interesting. So well, that whole it, notion. It that global yeah. experience. Yeah. Well, a global experience, and it spreads the responsibility for the ideation yes. over a much more diverse and kind of fertile landscape than having exactly. yes and i think you had mentioned to me too that you had found that you know, one of your pieces of advice for our cios was don't expect the business to be pulling this from you it really has to be a push that comes from the cio and, yes, and i'd like to yeah mm-hmm. i'd like to elaborate on that a little bit right so uh, a lot of times we are expecting and and me included initial mm-hmm. um stages of my CIO, I expected the business to come ask me for a, uh, a solution to their problem and, and I would respond to it, that it would be a very reactionary environment. Uh, since then, I found that business is too busy running the business well, and yeah. uh, very infrequently do we get feedback from them. Um, so instead, the paradigm has to shift where CIOs have to be more engaged with the business, asking the questions about mm-hmm. what their pain points are, having calls with the business more global that says, this is what we feel after studying the business, that these are the pain points that technology can be an enabler um, to really address those challenges. So leading rather than following is the way to go when it comes to digital transformation. Yes. Well, and I think that in many ways you really are living your motto that's up on the wall behind you about transforming IT into a trusted business partner and uh, really producing. That's why it's always so interesting to talk with you. Thank you for your time today, Sarah. This has been a, uh, a wonderful conversation, and I'm sure that our listeners have all gotten a lot out of it. So we appreciate your taking such a big chunk of your time. I appreciate the opportunity as well. All right, great. Thank you. Now, if you joined us late, you can watch this full episode later today. It'll be on CIO.com or on our YouTube channel, which is called IDG Tech Talk. You can also listen to audio podcasts that will be available uh, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please do join me for our next episode. I'll be back on Tuesday, May 7th at 2 in the afternoon again. And I'll be joined by Vipin Gupta, who is the CIO of Toyota Financial Services. And while you're at it, do subscribe to that new YouTube channel, IDG Tech Talk, where you can find all the previous episodes of CIO Leadership Live. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time.